webinars. Great. Um, this is the first of four webinars reporting the findings of the DACA study, which is all about developing research resources and a minimum data set for care homes for their adoption and use. Um, just a few administrative things. Um, for those of you who've just come in, if you could actually put your names and organisations in the chat box, then we'll know who, who's been here today. Um, as you can tell, um, we're going to record the session and the recording will be put up on the NIHR Arc of Eng East of England um, website. During the time when speakers are talking, um, let's make sure that our cameras and microphones are switched off um, and we'll put them back on again when at the end we have the question and answers. So what would be really helpful is as we go, if you could be putting your questions into the chat box and then uh, we can um, focus on those at the end of the presentations. But to set us off, I'm going to now invite um, Liz Jones, who is the policy director at the National Forum, which represents not-for-profit care homes, to give us an overview of the DACA study, which is led by Professor Claire Goodman at the University of Hertfordshire and involves a consortium of, of universities working together. So, Liz, over to you. Thanks, Julian. And... Um... Just to say, uh, at the National Care Forum, we represent all types of care and support. So I'd like you to think of us as the voice of the not-for-profit care and support sector. Uh, and it has been our privilege, actually, to be involved in the DACA study. Very important study that was conceived in the world before COVID and when social care data was in the wilderness. Um, and it's now, <laughs> it's now in the sunlit uplands of uh, focus by all sorts of people, um, including the government. So this is a, I'm really delighted that we've got this webinar series so we can share the insights and learnings of, of the study over the last few years with a much broader audience. So what is DATCHA all about? Um, it's quite a complicated study, but it's got a very simple aim. Uh, the aim of the study is to explore and enhance how information about resident quality of life and about um, care data in care homes for older people are more systematically shared between all the different organisations um, who are working to support uh, some of our most vulnerable people. So that's thinking about how that how we achieve the collection of the right data that's going to make a difference uh, for people's quality of care and quality of lives, and then how we can share that across different health and care organisations. So um, if you know anything about social care, you will know that there is huge amount of information and data being collected in different ways by different people about what happens in care home settings. Uh, and we also know that it's very difficult to compare that data. We know it's hard to share that data for comparison purposes and interrogate and interpret that data. And we know that different parts of the system ask for the same information in slightly different ways, which creates a huge data burden and kind of misses the point about the, the value of that big data and varied data. So Datch is based on the principle that a more consistent approach to how information about care home residents is recorded and handled and shared across their organisations is needed so that we can plan better for our current provision, our current service and quality. We can understand more about future needs of residents. We can understand about um, the effectiveness of existing treatments and services, and, and we can kind of build a better insight, really. I would say better actionable insights um, about this cohort of people we're serving now, but also um, people we'll be serving in the future. Uh, so Datch has got five different work packages and there is a fantastic infographic on the Datcha website, which shows you in, in one slide um, what those work packages are and how they're connected. Uh, and the webinar series is going to, to look at each of those different packages. Uh, but today's webinar focuses on the findings of the first two work packages. So the first work package, and this is fascinating, this told me loads of things I didn't know, 
the first work package looked at what's already known um, in terms of the data and evidence about how quality of life and quality of care are measured in care home research. Um, so presenting for work package one, and you might want to give us a, a little wave if you've got your cameras on, we've got Sarah, Sarah Kelly, we've got Guy, where's Guy? We've got Guy, uh, and we've got Karen. And Karen's gonna give us a wave, yay. Uh, and then we'll move on to the second work package. And this work package involved the creation of a, a safe place, a repository <coughs> where tools and data from care home research could be kept for other researchers so that we avoid uh, replication, duplication, and we're maximizing the value of all the public money invested in those pieces of research. Uh, so other researchers can benefit from them and build on them. And Lisa, where's Lisa? Lisa is going to talk to that. Um, so it's worth mentioning as well um, that the way that this study has been uh, designed um, and, and implemented has been underpinned by the idea that we were trying to create new ways of working and doing, undertaking research uh, in care homes, with care homes. That point, that we're talking about so, uh, research that is um, for social care, with social care, by social care, really, um, to make sure that the outputs and the learnings from the, the study are not just designed to be of use to researchers, but they're also going to help the people we're supporting, so we understand more about our residents, and as providers, we understand how we can respond better. We've got data and insights that will help us deliver better, deliver differently. Uh, so our work is informed not just by the findings of the research, but also by the lived experience of the people that this is all about, really. So the lived experience of residents, uh, their relatives and their loved ones, and our amazing workforce. Uh, and during the pandemic, obviously, when we designed the study, it was before COVID. So we had to find different and more creative ways of how we were going to honour our pledges around lived experience and proper participation and involvement from those key players. So Anne, give us a wave Anne, uh, is going to talk about this um, and I have to say this is one of the areas that I as somebody involved in it feel very proud of because I think we've tried really hard to be a, a learning listening um, project team. We've got some future webinars which we can tell you a bit more about at the end. Um, so that's going to look at how we actually moved to creating a minimum data set to pilot and how we've piloted it. Uh, but today we're focusing on those first two work packages. And um, as a person who's been involved in debates about social care data and intelligence and insights for quite a number of years now, uh, I have been constantly promoting the DATCHA study because I think it's got the potential to really offer us a step change in how we understand collectively the needs of people living in our, our care homes. And that's really important for researchers. I can see we've got quite a research focused um, audience here, but actually, you know, there's the people doing the doing. And so the insights and the findings um, from this study uh, particularly thinking about, about the data that we must have, the data we must share, the data that we must create and, and build, particularly thinking about quality of life. Those things are really important for people who are on the front line delivering services and those who are planning uh, strategically new services, quality improvement, uh, and how to kind of keep that focus on doing better all the time. So I think that has been a, a fantastic study. And I'm really looking forward to our colleagues uh, sharing their different presentations. And I hope you find it as fascinating as we all have. So thank you for coming. Thank you for giving up your lunch time and um, do ask those questions in the chat. Uh, and hopefully you'll feel inspired. Fri have a Friday where you leave this webinar inspired and um, ready to find out more. Thank you. Wonderful, Liz. Um, as you can see, Liz has been a great colleague and partner on the Duchess study. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Sarah Kelly from the University of Cambridge, and she's going to be addressing 
what measures have been used in care home research and, and what she can tell us about that. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Julianne and Liz, and um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Um, as, as Liz explained, um, I'm going to be talking about um, Work Package 1 and one of the evidence re reviews that we conducted for Work Package 1. <clears throat> so research in care homes is increasing and, and has the potential to um, shape evidence-informed care. Informed care. But it, it's really important that resident outcome measures are appropriate for older people and, and for use in care homes. So, so what we did, we set out to look at all the care home studies that have been published to date um, to identify um, answers to this question. What resident outcomes have been incorporated in care homes to date and, and how were they measured? And we did this using a, a scoping review of published research literature. Uh, we aim to identify all care home in intervention studies conducted between 2015 and 2022 um, and to identify the, the outcomes um, that were reported and also how those outcomes were actually measured. So just breaking that down a little bit, um, the key questions are where which resident outcomes have been measured um, in care home research to date. Um, we focused on outcomes for residents um, and we didn't include um, outcomes for staff in, in this study. How those outcomes were measured and which ones have been used most frequently. And we also conducted um, a consultation with care home staff and managers to ask how useful and relevant are these outcome measures to everyday life in a care home. So by outcome measure, we're, we're meaning any measurement of resident health and care outcomes, for example, physical function, mood, behaviour, cognition, quality of life. Um, and the outcome measurement measure is, is how those were measured. Um, for intervention research, um, we looked at published studies where something was changed for care home residents in the study. So that could be, for example, a new treatment or a way of delivering care or change in practice and policy. So we included clinical trials, we included randomised studies, non-randomised studies, before and after studies. And we used a scoping review approach because it's it's really good method for taking a broad overview of what's been done in, in an area. So after pouring over lots of studies and lots of um, evidence, uh, we found 396 studies, uh, intervention studies that have been conducted in care homes. These were um, conducted across 27 countries. We focused on high income countries um, with similar kind of economic um, capabilities to the UK. So most of the studies were from the USA, from Australia, from, from the UK. Across those studies, there were more than 12,000 care homes incorporated in that research and more than 800,000 residents. And because we were taking a broad overview, we included interventions of any type, really. So that, that covered a very broad range of interventions, but the, the most commonly occurring ones were those to do with medicines management, prescribing, physical function or performance activity, cognition, hospital transfer, length of stay, or oral health. Um, and these were delivered in various ways, sometimes as exercise interventions to improve physical function, or as educational interventions, or, or could be a combination of, of lots of different ways of, of implementing that intervention. So across those 396 included studies, when we, we drilled down and looked at what outcomes had been um, reported for residents. Um, more than 2,000 resident outcomes were reported um, using 732 different outcome measures. 
And it was really notable that almost 70% of those outcome measures were used only once. So used only one study, not used in any other study. Only 14 measures were used more than 20 times and only four were used more than 50 times. So there's a huge um, diversity in the outcome measures used um, and the vast majority of those outcome measures were reported only once. Um, reporting of how and who did the measurement was poor, whether the measurement was conducted by care home staff or by researchers. So in order to organise that more than 700 outcomes, um, we, we did some outcome mapping. We took those outcomes and we mapped them against an existing international framework um, for long-term care. Um, this is a resident assessment in, instrument, but what it does is it categorizes those res resident assessments into different categories. Um, so, so those categories are listed in, in the blue box there. Um, this was the InterI um, long-term care facilities um, measurement instrument. We found that actually not all of the outcomes that we found fitted into all of those categories and in particular quality of life outcomes, there wasn't really a category for that in, in that uh, resident assessment instrument. And, and there were a few other um, types of studies, blood tests, for example, that, that didn't fit into that framework. But what we just, we just use this as a framework for organising studies. We weren't doing the resident assessment with this framework. So what we found um, from the mapping results, this is um, all the outcome measures mapped by those, those categories that we, we put them into. Um, so the most frequently reported um, outcome measures were related to functional status and physical function and mood and behavior, then medications, cognition. Um, quality of life is being reported increasingly, but still um, a relatively small proportion of, of the outcomes that were reported. Um, and other outcomes that are important for day-to-day -day life in a care home, like continence, communication, were, were relatively poorly reported and, and really only reported in, in interventions that, that targeted those, um, th th those things. So the frequency of, if we go back into the individual measures that we use to report outcomes for residents and care homes, um, care home and resident records were used, uh, medical records and charts and blood tests, but a lot of um, outcomes were measured using scales, um, such as neuropsychiatric scales, um, cognition scales, measures of agitation, measures of depression. Um, some of the, a lot of these have been developed for um, clinical use, use in healthcare settings. Um, but increasingly, there are some quality of life measures um, getting into that uh, ranking chart, which is good to see. So our con consultation with care home staff um, came up with some really key important points. Um, the clinical focus of many of these outcome measures um, day-to-day -day well-being may be more important to residents. Um, the care homes already collect a lot of information regularly about their residents. Um, and that some of these measures, we, we um, discussed um, some of the physical function measures that are used in care home research. And that there were some views that some of these are a little bit outdated compared to the kind of detailed information that's already been collected by care homes care homes that also, that also reflect the sort of daily changes in, in resident abilities. So overall, um, many different outcome measures have been used in intervention research in care homes. This makes it really difficult to compare outcomes between different studies because they're, measure, they're reporting different measures. Um, and a lot of the outcome measures used have been developed for older people, but there's very few specifically developed for care home residents who are often more frail than older people living in the community and may need different um, outcome measures. What do we think all this means? Um, 
Certainly, there's evidence of growing research in care homes internationally. There's lots of variation in how outcomes are assessed and measured. Um, our findings support the development of core outcome sets for care home research. Um, and going forward, we need to make sure we're using measures suitable for residents and, and use in care home settings. And to do that, we need to work together with residents, families and friends and staff to make sure the studies are measuring what matters most in, in the most efficient and at least a burdensome, burdensome way to, to care home staff. Uh, just a, a funding funded by the NIHR. Um, and that's a very quick overview of, of this work. Um, if you'd like more information, um, the full paper has been published here, this QR code there and web link there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. That, that's wonderful. Um, gets us off to a really good start. Um, and some shocks and surprises, I think, in, in, in those findings. Let's move on to the second presentation, which is going to be given by Lisa, Lisa Irvine from um, the University of Hertfordshire. And she's going to actually talk about the care home research repository that was created. Um, so over to you, Lisa. Thanks, Gillian. Let me just share. It's okay. Everyone see it? Okay, so hi everyone, thank you for coming. Um, I'm Lisa Irvine, I work at the University of Hertfordshire. So my role in Dacha is to lead the second work package along with Jenny Burton, and that's the green logo here. Um, we're developing an archive of data collected in randomised controlled trials, which have been conducted in care homes. Um, so I'm going to explain about the trials archive, why we set it up, how it will work, and what it might mean for care home staff and residents. I hope the discussion will get everyone to think a bit more about all the data that gets collected in care homes and other ways in which it could be reused. So the overarching aim of DATCHA is to make better use of existing data in, or in order to learn more about care homes and the residents. So where do researchers go to find out information about care homes? Well, there's actually lots of data already out there. There's administrative data such as like age and sex from um, census, but unfortunately we can't readily link this to health or quality of life. For large cohort studies like ELSA for ageing or CFAS for cognition, it's much richer data, but the proportion of care home residents included is very low. It's also difficult to get consistent information about care, home them care homes themselves, such as staffing and ownership. You have to remember that care homes are private organisations, so there's no centralised system like the NHS. The best source for this type of information is CQC, but again, it's not particularly detailed. So for new research questions, researchers try randomised control trials, which are considered the gold standard for med medical research. And they involve randomly assigning participants to one of two or more treatment groups and then comparing the outcomes of the two groups. So our care home RCTs collect high quality, detailed information about every care home and every rare resident they recruit. While care home interventions cover a variety of health areas, the inclusion or criteria is usually pretty similar. So there's lots of overlap in the outcome measures used and the information collected. But um, in terms of the challenges of conducting RCTs in care homes, we know that care homes are a unique environment and uh, it's actually quite hard to run trials in care homes. Uh, the most common challenges are recruitment, because we know these are older adults and they're frail with multiple health conditions, um, obtaining informed consent. Usually there's a lot of cognitive impairment, so we need to seek assent from the next of kin or the care home staff. And um, Maintaining confidentiality, this demographic has a lot of concern about their privacy and managing the care of participants because they have lots of ongoing medical care. It's important to coordinate this. So RC, generally RCTs are time consuming for everyone involved and um, researchers and particularly the care home staff. Uh, they're expensive to run, generally they're about two million pounds per trial, and it can be difficult to obtain funding for these studies. So I thought it would be useful to outline the kind of data that care home trials tend to collect. It's not just all about the intervention and treatment effects. At the care home level, um, increasingly, the more recent ones tend to collect lots of background information about each home, like the case mix, funding, ownership, ratings, staffing, and all this can be quite difficult to get from other sources. 
uh, key demographics and medical conditions, health resource use, major events through the course of the trial, such as falls or infections. Um, outcome measures can be tracked over the follow-up period to allow for longitudinal analysis. So there's lots of different clinical areas, which means we have lots of different outcome measures, but some measures can be very specific to one trial, but there's actually lots that are commonly reported in most of them. So individually, these trials are valuable, but given that they collect very similar information about the same demographic group, if we combined the individual participant data from trials, we'd have a bigger data set with more statistical power to repurpose and answer additional research questions. If you completely ignore the intervention, we could therefore treat RCT data as a year in the life of a care home resident. And my focus is whether we can pull and reuse RCT data to answer new questions about care homes and residents. So for repurposing, we're interested in collecting all the quantitative data collected in the trial, not just the summary results. And this is what we call individual participant data or IPD. The advantages is that it can obviously save time and money by eliminating the need for to collect new data. It's also a lot quicker for new researchers because they don't have to collect this. Um, it's also flexible because with you repurposing the data, you can answer a whole lot of questions and that maybe weren't originally considered when the data was collected. But the challenges are, um, obviously we need to ensure that the data is of good enough qu uh, quality to support the research question, but generally the sticking point comes with data access and data sharing. So researchers must obtain permission from the original data collectors in order to share this data. We need an infrastructure in place for future researchers. It needs to be ready to use, try and cut down the red tape, and this is essentially what we're trying to do with the Vitch to Trials archive, so that if we do all of the legwork now, it would be easier for other researchers to access in future. So what is Vichta? Um, the full title is the Virtual International Care Home Trials Archive. Um, we're working with the Virtual Trials Archive at the University of Glasgow, hence that's where the VTA came from. And they've been doing similar work in trials uh, originally from stroke since 2002, but they've got a lot more on um, renal transplant and cognition and lots of different stuff. Um, so once that shift funding has ended, the, the, the care home repository will formally migrate into the VTA and it will be a permanent home when this funding ends. Um, all trial data is sent to the VTA directly and will remain at the University of Glasgow secure server. In terms of inclusion criteria, we've kept it pretty broad. We want any RCT conducted in UK care homes published in the last 10 years. Um, after DATCHA, the VTA have experience of pooling international trials, so we'll be able to accept uh, data from outside the UK, but just for the time being, we thought we'd walk before we could run. Um, in addition to the trial data set, we'll request important study documentation like protocol and statistical analysis plans, data dictionaries, that kind of thing, anything to help us with um, preparing the data for pooling. We also need evidence of participant consent or assent. So the data is fully anonymized before we receive it. So the ethics procedure has actually been quite straightforward. We have university ethics from Hearts and Glasgow, and we completed a data protection impact assessment. So in terms of sharing trial data with Fichta, um, to submit the trial data, we have a one-off data sharing agreement, which is between the original trial sponsor, Hertfordshire and Glasgow. As I said before, the data must be fully anonymized, so that this to minimize the risk of re-identification. Um, we will work with the data custodian, which is usually the clinical trials unit, um, and there'll be a secure file transfer to Glasgow. The electronic dance data is stored securely in the University of Glasgow server and will not be transferred or copied to any other location. And for pooling, I've actually been doing this. So I log on to the Glasgow server in the same way that the future researchers would. It's a VPN, there's a two-step security process. So it's all, got all the infrastructure in place. In terms of accessing which data, um, so none of this would be possible if we didn't have buy-in from the original trialists. Whoever wishes to join and to share their data will form the trialist steering committee. Trialists ask act as gatekeepers for their respective data sets. As external request, researchers request access to the pooled trial data, the steering committee will see the proposals and how the trial data will be used. They can object, in which case their trial data will be excluded, 
that if they like the research, as I think they generally have done with the Glasgow experience so far, they'll have the opportunity to get actively involved in the research if they are interested in it. Um, before any novel research is submitted for publication, the steering committee can review this paper and they're also re uh, recognised in the publication. So that was the kind of buy-in we got. And as new trials are added, the new, tri new trialists will join this committee. So this will expand over the years. So the pooled IPD um, that the uh, future researcher um, receives will be tailored to their explicit research questions based on the variables that they've requested, etc. They won't just get access to everything. So as of July 2023, we have six trials um, spread over eight cohorts. It was collected, the data was collected between 2011 and 2019. We've got 5,669 residents from 339 care homes across England, Scotland and Northern Ireland. And um, we do have, a, uh, we're in contact with another trial, so we should hope to get some Welsh data quite soon. The combined research cost was 23, uh, was 13 million pounds. Um, you can see that it's listed chronolo uh, chronologically. So we had two from quite long ago in 2011, and then 2016, 2017, 2018. We are in discussions with other trials that ran between those dates. So potentially like longitudinal, um, have care homes changed in that period, have residents, you know, we can start to build up a picture that way. The interventions were, um, two were looking at dementia, two were polypharmacy, one was falls prevention, and one was incontinence. Um, it's worth noting that it was a real mix of universities and the, like some of the sponsors were universities, some of them were NHS trusts. Often the data was held in a completely different organisation. For example, at the CTU, was it a different university? So it was really important to build relationships with multiple partners and it takes quite a lot of time. Um, in terms of the data availability, um, as you'd expect, 72% female. The age, the mean age was 85, but um, there was quite a large range. Um, one of the studies had a very small number of younger adults and um, we just kept all the data, all the original data, we didn't exclude anything. So that's, um, that's why the range is so large there. Um, so there were some variables that weren't explicitly um, put in the trial, but we've generated to help with classification. So things like the study year or the country. Um, the rest of the data is a bit patchy, as you'd expect. Some RCTs, particularly the more recent ones, have loads of information about care homes and the changes within the care home over that study period. There's lots and lots of outcomes data. Generally, the proxy is well reported, but the self-reported is less so. Um, in terms of comorbidity, there's a lot of variation with how this was collected in each study. Most studies had some information, but it, it's a bit, bit tricky to pull. Um, diagnose, uh, dementia diagnosis is available for all, um, but some and also some trials only recruited residents with dementia. And um, so other ways that they categorized comorbidities was with the Charleston Index, ICD-10, um, binary yes, no, and um, there's also free text. So some of it can get a bit messy. Um, there's also resource use and medications for all trials, but this hasn't yet been pulled. So in terms of future uses, this is not an exhaustive list of ideas for future research. Um, most of them have come from the trial from the trial team or the Dacha team or um, generally economists, which is my background, or psychometricians, and there's a lot of interest in quality of life. The pool data can be used for exploratory analysis, basically to better understand the population, to refine future research questions. Um, we see potential for work around identifying subgroups of residents, such as high and low dependency, or there's small groups which are re recurring hospital admissions, or for example, what happens to a resident after a major event like a fall. Um, there's workforce and funding status. Data can be used um, to look at the, at the variation between home to home, and all this can be linked back to resident outcomes. So it's important to think that, to know that Vichita will only succeed if people know about it and use it and will be constantly evolving as new trials are added. So in terms of next steps, um, we're thinking about public involvement and we want to make sure that we have prioritized the right questions for the future research. And um, so our next step is to ask stakeholders themselves what kind of research priorities we should, we should have going forward. This will be similar to a James Lind Alliance work. So we're conscious that all the previous ideas in the last slide had come from researchers 
but it's important to capture the ideas directly from the care home residents and staff themselves. The residents are the primary stakeholders and we need to hear their voice. So this ties in well with a study that Anne and myself are working on called Chappie, which was uh, it, it stemmed from Dacha, and it's asking activity providers who already work in the care homes to facilitate discussion about research. So we're going to use this and ask them about the research priorities and like ask for suggestions. Um, so this is all early days. So in conclusion, data repurposing is a valuable tool for researchers who are interested in improving the care of older adults. It can be more efficient and cost effective way to conduct research than conducting new RCTs. Um, it can answer questions which could be difficult or impossible to answer with new RCTs. Um, Fitchta will be available for use from early 2024 and our priority setting among care home staff and residents will continue post stature. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. That's that's wonderful. So um, as you can see in the Dacha study, we're, we're not only interested in what um, we can learn, what we can know, um, for instance, about outcome measures in, in care homes, but also how can we make the system better? And I think this is a good example uh, with the Victor um, study becoming a repository to share tools and to share data to stop the replication and duplication. So we're going to move on now to our third presentation, which is um, given by Guy Perrier, who's at Norwich Medical School. And this is going to focus on what needs to happen to enhance care home research. And he'll, he'll explain how he came to his conclusions. Over to you, Guy. Thank you. Could I just check? Oh. Can people see that screen OK? Yes. OK, fabulous. So um, just a quick intro. Uh, this doesn't immediately fit with Dacha, but it was part of the call from HS and DR where they were looking into more um, sort of research synthesis and uh, establishing how effectively we're, we're conducting research in, in a care home setting. I uh, worked on a, on a large phase three study looking at the effectiveness of occupational therapy for stroke survivors living in care homes, and it produced neutral findings. So with working with the data, I was very much frustrated because I felt that we'd sent a message to commissioners that this intervention didn't work. And yet so many residents did benefit, but the way that we had approached the research is that it came out uh, as, as a neutral finding, not a negative finding, but a neutral finding. So this title, Did the Trial Kill the Intervention? Um, it's, uh, its original sort of question came from a paper by Tony Arthur, who was a, is now an emeritus professor at the University of East Anglia. So um, I put the QR codes because I don't mind telling you, this was a labor of love over lockdown. There was a lot of work that went into it. So I'm only going to speak for about, you know, five minutes. But I'd encourage you, especially if anyone's interested in, in thinking about more of the qualitative nature of, of what, how um, care home staff and residents and, and researchers have actually found conducting research in care homes to go to that um, QR code that's got quotes. There's hundreds there and um, that might be hopefully be a repository for you as well. But as we've already discussed, um, conducting care, uh, research in care homes is complex. And when we're dealing with complexity, it doesn't immediately lend itself to an RCT, randomized controlled um, design, because they are inherently reductionist and you are forced to put all your eggs into one basket to identify a primary outcome measure and then to try and control the study well enough to have uh, validity at the end of that whole exercise. So the theme of, of what I'm about to present to you is to question, once you've done a baseline assessment, done some work in the middle, and you've got to your primary endpoint, is that primary endpoint actually measuring accurately the intervention that it was intended to, to, to do? So I did a, a trawl of, of the NIHR funding um, kind of website 
and I tracked about six or seven RCTs that were funded between 2007 and 2014, which were then later published around sort of 2016 to, to 19 mark. And I found that uh, eight and a half million had, had essentially produced neutral findings. So I wanted to delve into those studies in particular, but then I wanted to treat this internationally. So I went, so I did a systematic review using a framework synthesis approach to explore if there were alternative explanations. And it's, it's the norm, and thankfully it's the norm, that a lot of large scale randomized controlled trials also have a par parallel process evaluation that studies element of, of trial conduct. So, as I say, so I, I used a framework synthesis approach, and if anyone wants to find out more about that, you can go to the Cochrane website, and um, uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's some really valuable information on there to find out more. The main theme that I found was this idea of procedural drift. Everything starts really well, but then steadily, 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 either there's a reduction in the amount of the intervention that's actually delivered, or there's just things that start to go awry. And the other main theme from the review was the need to, to uh, change how, how we're approaching our, our delivery. Often there's education sessions at the start of an intervention, and there's an expectation that the learning that's happened in those education sessions are going to be sustained throughout the course, the duration of the RCT. And from the process evaluations, that is clearly unlikely. Either staff leave or there's just a general reduction or people forget, or sometimes people don't even have time to attend the session in the first place. So action learning takes on more of a course of like a coaching type model. So how can we actually, you know, proceed along together? And most often I'd say that the implementation failures, which sadly there were many, were relation based, okay? And hopefully that's a theme that's gone on throughout today. So I used a, a complex systems approach to as a, as a framework. And it was the SEEPS model, which is a, a systems engineering. Um, and it tracked, uh, so I coded things, whether it was a person level, a task level, organization level, all of those different elements that you can see on the screen. And this is called a radar plot. And the majority of, of barriers to successful implementation of research in care homes were very much in those three of, of a task level or an organizational level or, or a care home staff level. And research load overall, I think there was about 28 context domains, but the leader was, was research load. And here's something that I've been guilty of. You know, if you're going to introduce a new task in an already very packed time and, you know, schedule, what tasks are going to be removed? And, and as a research team, we can't make that decision without, you know, adequate and thorough engagement with the care homes that we're involving. And then equally, we can't forget the, the nature of group dynamics within the care home. There was often reports of um, people being dissatisfied or not included. Perhaps it wasn't their um, decision to, to participate in the study. And all you need is one fairly influential voice and the whole thing can really, you know, go awry quite quickly, indicated by this quote, you know, someone thought it was a stupid project and then things dissipated from there. So we also generated, hopefully, um, a helpful leaflet um, that goes into, uh, summarizes the findings um, from, from the review. The QR code is there. And we separated it out in things that the care home team might want to think about um, while hosting and conducting and being involved with the research. Certainly things that the research team need to think about before, during and after um, conducting the study. But my, as you see, the most important element was, was around collaboration. So how are you going to start this whole initiative and proceed along together to a successful outcome? So if I were to summarize, 
for, for the research team, prioritize simplicity. That is essential. And if we know that procedural drift is likely to happen, unless that there is um, ongoing, let's say, structures to try and prevent it, you need to try and build in process measures that are going to detect it. And um, that might be around intervention delivery. It might be feedback. It might be all sorts of things. But to uh, you know, to engage in co-design is is the is the obvious part. Collaborative activities, as I say, adopt a coaching model, but that's a two way street is that the, the, the care staff can also coach research staff and hopefully it will be reciprocal benefit in, in, in actually conducting research overall. And then um, if there are opportunities for, for a, engagement between research teams and the care home team, I know that it's very difficult. But uh, that seemed essential to make sure that there was productive communication throughout the duration of the study. And activities for the care home team. This is really important. How can you sustain resource allocation for the duration of the study? That was one of the main themes around organizations that things started well, but then it couldn't be sustained. OK, so I think that pretty much um, wraps it up. But what I'd like to say is that we need to change our approach and consider this as social learning. So how are we going to learn to do things together and um, to move away from fixed endpoints to consider, are we moving in the right direction? And how can action learning essentially help that in this two way street? OK, I'll stop there. Thank you, Guy. Um, some really important messages there um, about being more collaboratively, working more collaboratively with care homes in the design and execution of studies. Um, let's move on now to Karen Spilsbury from the University of Leeds, who also runs Niche, um, which has very close collaborative working practices with care homes in, in her local area. Um, so, Karen, you're going to talk to us about what care homes need to think about when participating in research. Translating uh, the work that Guy has just presented into what it should be a useful resource for care home teams that are considering um, taking part in research. Um, so I think we'd all agree that um, people living in care homes uh, deserve the best care and they deserve to live in environments that promote quality of life. Sorry, I'm distracted by. I'm still on slide one anyway, Lindsay, you keep going um, in environments that promote quality of life and staff themselves have a, a real role in um, providing, providing that. So we've seen a growth in research over the past decade uh, with and for homes. And, and part of that's because we recognise that research has the potential to inform and enhance what works to enhance residents' experience um, of care and to promote quality of life. But we've also heard that research is very demanding. So, as I said, this is building on the work that Guy's just presented. Um, Lindsay, can you take it a slide forward? Thank you. And, um, and what we've done is developed some guidance, which we hope will help care home teams and communities consider whether they want to uh, engage with research and be involved. Um, if you're a researcher on the call, then what we also hope is that this will help you think about the relationships that Guy has spoken about in his presentation to think about how you can work with homes uh, to support a, a really healthy research partnership and opportunities uh, for involvement and engagement. So I'll just acknowledge uh, my colleagues that helped uh, develop this guidance. Uh, my co-authors here um, and also that when we developed this guidance we did speak with uh, our partners in in the niche leads partnership just to ensure that it, it it made sense so this guidance as i've said is particularly about how care home communities can partner with research groups to support uh, the delivery of research that matters for them it's the next slide please lindsay 
So on this slide, you'll see we've divided this into to five key areas. And the most important questions that teams and communities should first ask is, you know, is this important to us? Does this question matter? And secondly, are there going to be benefits for us? And I think it's only if care home teams um, talking with uh, the staff groups, uh, with residents and their families and friends, if these two questions lead to an answer of, well, yes, then that's when you start to think about the other three areas. And we've called those three areas um, the capacity. So does the home have the capacity and resources? Are they ready for engagement? So can they commit? And the support is about the relationships that need to be in place to support that research. So in the next slide, you'll see that we've taken those three areas and we've offered some guidance, which are the sorts of questions that care home teams can ask themselves uh, to determine whether the answer to these is yes. And uh, if it is, that will determine how ready they are to engage in, in a research partnership. And also these are useful areas that care home researchers uh, or researchers working with care homes can think about so that when approaching uh, care home managers and staff initially, they can think, have I got a good answer to these questions so that I can support this research partnership? So all these uh, areas, I'm, I'm not going to read them out, out it, it, one by one, but what care home teams are really asking themselves is, you know, can we do it? Have we got the staff? Can we free people up to do this? Um, can we commit? So can we engage? Can we engage in the training? Um, can we engage in any data collection activities that may be going on or any of the systems that this new study may introduce? And finally, um, are we going to have the support? The support and, how, and do we know how to access that support when inevitably things may not quite go to plan? So we believe that if, uh, you know, teams, so the partnerships between care homes and researchers work through these, then it enhances uh, the readiness so that on your marks, pause, ask yourself all of this, then go, because maybe you are ready uh, to, to go into that partnership with a care home team. So, and, and this is important so that care homes have the opportunity to engage in research that addresses questions that matter for them, for people that live in the homes, for the staff, and to promote quality of care, quality of life, and quality of work. And so on this final slide, um, I've directed you to the Dacha study uh, web pages, and you can access our paper that summarises all of this work. And you can also access uh, the guidance. So if you're thinking, actually, I really want to know what those questions are, you can take the time um, to look through those. Um, so thank you very much. Um, look forward to the discussion and the, and the further presentations to come. And Lindsay, thank you for rescuing me, as always. Wonderful, Karen. Thank you so much. Um, so I guess this is another example of how this particular project has not only um, endeavoured to um, uh, be worthwhile for the researchers, but has sought to make a difference to the care homes and um, the production of this guidance to help care homes make their decisions about whether to participate in research, um, I, I think is very helpful. Let's move on to our next presentation, which is coming from Anne Killett at the University of East Anglia and um, is all about new ways of working to engage uh, residents more in care home research. And she'll tell you the story of how we got there. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yes. And it, it sort of weaves through it very much with um, what everybody else has been talking about, because as as Liz said right at the beginning, um, it's been something we've worked hard on through the project. So the title of our webinar is about shifting the balance. And that's very much something that, as you can see, what's gone wrong when the balance has been in the wrong direction, when researchers are not um, thinking enough about um, the care home world. So what happens if we shift it and those in the care homes can start really being in the, in the driving seat. So starting from the point of, of, of why that would be a really valuable thing, then people who live and work in care homes and family members who support people living in care homes 
absolutely have the day-to-day -day experience about the sorts of issues and challenges that are really important. So they have ideas about what might help change those things. And they also have an appreciation of the sorts of new ideas or new ways of working that might be realistic and those that just won't fly at all for some reason. And these insights really should be shaping research from the earliest stages, really right from the very beginning, when we think, what are the important research questions here? And that was something Lisa mentioned with, with, with the archive, what questions could be answered and, and what other, other, other priorities. Then also this expertise clearly can inform how can the research be done in, a, in an effective way, in a way that isn't overly burdensome on care homes, in a way that communicates uh, where there can be a shared understanding between people living and working in care homes and researchers. And also then through into getting the findings and beginning to make sense of them and interpreting them and finally planning um, changes in practice that hopefully come from useful research. So I want to talk a bit about um, the way we developed partnerships and worked in, in, in Dacha. For care home managers, care home staff and family members, we developed a panel, a panel of people um, from each of those groups. And we're meeting four times a year. We are meeting online. And in that panel, we discuss and comment and, 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 and the, the panel members advise on the research process, how we should get people involved, how we can reach people. And we're now beginning, as you can imagine, to, to, to look at findings. And we've been doing that all the way along from when, when we first started talking with the panel about the work that um, the work that Sarah talked about right at the beginning and Guy, those literature reviews, we were talking to the panel members, getting their input into um, the sort of search terms, the, uh, how what we should be looking for in, in the research and then making sense as as um, as certainly Sarah referred to of what was coming out of and, and what the implications were of what we were finding. So how we work is that Julienne, Liz and I and other colleagues, we might meet with members of the research team who want to come to the panel and we'll talk with them about what's a good way to present the current stage of the research with the panel, um, what will most help them, the panel members, make sense and make a realistic contribution to what we're what, what, what sh what's happening. And then after the so that the um, the researcher might come along, give a presentation to the to the panel on the Zoom meeting, and the little picture here, um, one of our researchers was coming and, and talking, Rachel came and talked to the panel about the current data collection in care homes. And she said, the, the um, panel members had said, we'd like to be able to see what it is that care staff taking part in this research, what will they see on their screens uh, for their care systems if they're taking part in this study? So here is, um, Rachel was presenting um, what, what people, the care home staff in the study were seeing, so that our panel members could really engage and, and think through with her any around particular issues with that. Then once information from the panel has informed the study, later researchers come back and say, well, what's changed? What do we do? How do we pick up on what you said? Was it, you know, to what extent was it possible? to be um, to put that into into the research practice. So that was family members, care home staff, care home managers. We also were really felt it really important to have public involvement to work in partnership with residents. This is something that that has been done much less in in care home research over the years and and can be challenging and 
we were particularly having to think hard because we'd planned to meet regularly with, in a couple of care homes with, with groups of residents. We couldn't do that face to face because of COVID. But um, a member of the team, a family carer herself, came up with the suggestion that we could work with activity providers. So we made contact with NAPA, who the Professional Association for Activity Providers, and they've really been helpful and flown with this work. And we've developed this approach where the activity providers carry out the involvement activity with members of their residents in their care home who are interested to take part. Um, they advise us about some of the needs, what sorts of activities, what sorts of communication, what sort of prompts will be helpful for residents. And then the researchers on the team develop activity packs that will mean that give a really good starting point for the activity providers already obviously busy they can pick up this pack that they've had input and, and commented on but then they can they can run with it and and it's been interesting that they've wanted elements in that pack that really represent a range of needs for example for some people and i know um one of somebody put Andy put in, I think, a comment about sorting cards. Well, we've had activities a bit like that. Sorting cards, um, keywords, yes and no, which are priorities, which are not priorities, those sorts of activities. We've also had creative activities such as collage and things to stimulate discussion. But for some people in some in one care home, they wanted to take quite a formal approach and they actually wanted to um, fill in a survey and we did designed kind of a little Likert like survey. So a range of activities there and then when the activity provider has carried out the public involvement activity, listen to the discussion and the input from the residents, the activity providers then meet back with us as researchers and feedback what the priorities of the residents are on that on that issue and NAPA offer ongoing support from their project manager to the activity providers who who've been who are involved with us. So what sorts of influences? I can't really sort of say everything because as you can see it's really been a partnership all the way through and I think the things that we've seen come out today already have shown that influence. But some of the, the, the things that, that were in you know that, that we we could particularly think about we learnt for example from our our panel members that one of the things that's really important to try and bring into a minimum data set if we can combine it is the information from community services from community nursing and from physiotherapy as well as information about GP use and hospital use. One thing that's run strongly all the way through is the importance of capturing quality of life we don't just want clinical measures um, People want their quality of life to be considered and um, to be part of um, data sets that are collected in care homes. We've also really properly, I think, in the study, appreciated the realities um, of recording information if, for those people in care homes. There's a lot of duplication in what they're asked to report. There's a lack of direct usefulness of what's gathered often for care homes and the lack of um, usability um, and access um, to, to um, collated information when the care home wants to say, well, I put in for this, let me see what I can learn back out from it for the care home. Residents have told us how important um, hospital admissions are in terms of something they worry about, something that impacts on their well-being, something that they fear will reduce function while they're in hospital and therefore asked us when we're looking at some of the data sets to bring together and, and what questions we can analyse from that, they would really want to look at associations between hospital admissions and other factors that we can look at in the data. I know our colleagues um, in, in some of the later work packages are picking up on that. We've been helped in terms of carrying out the research in the care homes ways to communicate with residents and family members and staff and also 
the feedback that care homes will be interested to receive. That's been really well informed by our panel and by our residents. And so we've also had things that they're less, we're less able to respond to. So it, very early on, it became clear that people felt it was very important that um, it would be so valuable to have a data set that has shared integrated data between care and health and that can be looked at in real time, perhaps by family members, also by residents. Um, that's beyond the scope of the project, but clearly something that's important and that you know, we can bear in mind and feed into future work and, and, and any liaison with, with people in policy. <clears throat> Excuse my voice giving out. So next steps ongoing. Um, we're in the care homes at the moment collecting data and so really mindful of what we can usefully feed back to care homes currently who are involved in the project um, from, the, from the data that's been, been shared by them so far. We want to develop um, ways of communicating the findings to, that's, that are particularly tailored to care home staff and to residents. We're looking at possibly doing an infographic with that or a film. Um, we've had two members of the panel um, Marlene, a care home manager, and, and Emily, a senior carer, who've written an article about research involvement, what it's, in, what it's meant for them, what they've got from it, and suggestions and steps to their peers as to how they could get involved. And we're hoping that that will be published in one of the um, sector journals. Um, Lisa mentioned CHAPI, which is a research study where Marlene, the care home manager, where um, Napa are partners in the research, absolutely on an equal footing with, with, with us researchers. And already in that, they've done some training for us about researching in care homes and working with people with dementia and asked us to reciprocate. And we'll be doing some training about research. How do, how do people get involved in research uh, and, and some research methods, approaches? Um, so that's a very reciprocal relationship. Um, and we're looking to do shared training um, with, yeah, that's the point I was just making actually. Yeah, we, we're sharing our training with each other, care providers training us and researchers, um, learning together, a really good example of action learning. So I'll just finish with that, thinking of that research process, that thinking of the importance of of shared work all the way along the steps of that journey. So thanks very much, everybody. Um, and looking forward to some questions and discussion. Thank you, Anne, that's lovely. So I think um, we've got um, some good time now for questions and comments and discussion. And um, Lisa's very kindly sent through um, some of the questions that have been on the chat. Um, so Liz Graham has said, conclusions for work package one suggest we need to develop new measures suitable for care home residents. Are there any plans to develop work of a new adapted measures as part of DATCHA? Um, and Liz gave a response um, to that, but I just wondered if there was more that um, others of the team might wish to say. Perhaps Claire? Yeah, so I mean, I think to reiterate um, Liz's point is we we all, we haven't reported on this yet. It'll be in the I think in the next um, in subsequent webinar. But um, we did a national survey looking at all the data that care homes collect, and it is this point is the the, the worry is about adding information. It's more about agreeing what information we would want that's going to be useful. But what the one thing that Dacia has done is is in its minimum data set is testing the use of outcome measures for quality of life and so we've introduced that with all our study homes and one of the findings we'll be looking to see how that information is collected how useful it is for staff as well as for those who are not in the care home um, and how that data could be used so I think that's the biggest addition that we've got in the current study and then uh, absolutely we'll be saying this is where we've got uh, data that is easy to standardize this is where 
a lot more thought needs to go into agreeing how this information is presented. Thank you, Claire. Um, just just want to make special welcome to Sandra Duggan, who is a carer who, who's on the call today. Um, so thank you for joining us today, Sandra, and also for, for your comments in the chat box. Um, looking at them, I think um, Liz has, um, um, Lisa has responded to your questions. Is there anything else, um, Sandra, that you would like to ask? You can come off mute and put your um, video on, um, or do you feel your questions have been answered? I, I think they've been answered. Thank you. Yeah. Lovely. Well, great that you're here. Thank you. Um, so moving on. Um, Alison Waller is saying that she'd like to hear more about the activity providers and um, we've just finished Anne's presentation and I just wondered whether um, you feel that you've heard what you wanted to hear about activity providers or is there another question you would like to ask? So that's for Alison Waller if you want to come off mute and come on the call otherwise we'll assume that your questions have been addressed through Anne's presentation. Okay, um, so then there's a um, question for Guy from Andy um, P from Aston. And um, Andy, you're talking about using QSort tool and um, your comments here about um, how it gives users more opportunity to have more to say about their quality of life. Um, do you want to come on the call and, and tell us a bit more about your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I've done research in the past um, as more of a, a data collector, like a research assistant, if you like, in care homes and schools and um, community centres. And we've used this QSort methodology. So we've got a kind of tool. We actually use poker stick, poker chips with statements on, um, and we use those for whatever the the topic is so obviously we've done some on knife crime in community centers things like that um and that was basically on resilience what we were looking for there like whether certain a bit like what you're doing like the activities with that if, if these activities are done in these centers is that building quality of life so we would tailor the statements around that so my idea with this would be using statements for like um do you like your meal meals early? Do you like your meals later? Things like this, trying to personalise it. So instead of saying, what do you like? And getting a response, you're politely forcing the the um, participant to move them into what, what they prefer more and then what, what they obviously dislike more. And then that way you can obviously cater. For, you don't just say, oh, they like watching TV. That's just one thing. You said they like watching TV. They also like to get out in fresh air. They like to have a walk in a park. So you're tailoring each individual's person-centred care, which, you know, ultimately will improve their quality of life. Great. Um, Guy, do you have um, any thoughts or comments on that? Not especially, but um, where I think is important, because there's a lot of researchers on the call, um, to reflect that there has been an update to the MRC guidance in, you know, designing, developing and evaluating complex interventions. And it's fair to say the, the appreciation of complexity is encouraging us to move slightly further away from what can be described as an attribution model. So you do your baseline, you do some work, if you've controlled the, the context enough, you can attribute your outcome, any kind of change of outcome to what has gone on with the intervention. Now, when it comes to care homes and, and social programs, it's really, really difficult to have all of that control. And it's all of that control that's costing all the money. So we need to reflect, our, how are we trying to approach this idea of, of deciding whether we've made a difference or not? And it's fair to say that RCTs, the way they're used in the current format, it's very debatable. So there's a possibility to move from a attribution model and the MRC guidance talks about this more in the abstract because we haven't had it 
reliably confirmed, if you like, move towards a contribution model. And that's more aligned to learning. Are we moving in the right direction? Rather than thinking about has this, has this intervention surpassed an arbitrary measure of statistical significance, which it is arbitrary, there's no actual evidence behind why we use 95%, um, are we are we continually to move in the right direction? And that's where I think a lot of where Dacha is, is certainly doing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. Um, do any of the other team members wish to make a comment or um, are you are you happy with that response, Andy? Yes, by all means, yeah, it's, it's spot on. Yeah, brilliant. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Karen Hull is um, interested in learning more about the action learning guy and, and what you've learned from that. Um, Yeah, I think it was just that classic one, and, and I've been guilty of it, is that you want to try uh, to enable everyone to be on the same level at the start of a project. So a lot of education is delivered at the start, but then there's no guarantee of what happens after that. And what we what was certainly observed in, in the published uh, process evaluations is that, as I say, it was akin to procedural drift. So action learning um, is more akin to a coaching model. So if, if we're designing an intervention, are we just going to drop it and expect it to fly? Or are we going to be on hand to help it to be nudged along? And then, then you can actually find out if, if it's more realistic to try and have tweaks to the intervention rather than just to stand back and leave it. That's the kind of the problem with an RCT model is you start it, it's on a train track, and off it goes. You can't adjust it. But, you know, there could be, hopefully in the future, more opportunities to modify and adjust. Thank you, Guy. Um, so, um, uh, lastly, Namaran Narmano um, has said that the QR code for quotes isn't working. Um, just to reassure you, all the presentation, ah, Guy? What I can say, I, I flagged that, um, uh, Lisa very helpfully has put a link to the paper and that uh, spreadsheet is in the supplementary um, evidence of the paper. So apologies if the QR code doesn't work, but it's all there via the paper. Brilliant. So the presentation and the recording will all be put up on the, DACA web, um, on the NIHR East of England ARC website. So that's all the questions so far. And I'm just wondering if actually what we could do is um, in the rest of the time um, is just get some thoughts about what has surprised you in these presentations. Um, you know, is there something in particular that you feel you have learned or indeed something you might wish to go and um, take away and think about more? So I'm going to suggest that you use the chat box for this at or you come um, and put on your um, video and we could take it in person. Um, but it'd be really interesting to hear from you. You know, what's, what has surprised you about these presentations or what's one of the things in particular that has struck you? So if you'd be willing to come um, and show your video, um, we could take one or two from the audience or I could focus the questions back to the panel members. Can I ask a question, Julia? Terrific. Um, uh, while everyone's thinking, um, I was struck um, by the repository. I'm always struck. There are so many amazing things in this study. So I was struck by the potential of the repository and some of the things you were suggesting, Lisa. Um, and one of the things that struck us a lot in our work with integrated care systems is that um and kind of the nhs sort of central offer you know they come up with great ideas and then integrated like local systems are, have the responsibility for implementing them and the lens is always what's good for the system first and then the next lens is potentially what's good for people sometimes it's what's good for the hospital to be honest so I was wondering whether there's the potential for thinking about studies that 
actually have a look at how well those new models of, of um, joining up health and care, so thinking about urgent community response, thinking about virtual wards, thinking about enhanced health and care homes, whether there's a way to design studies that have the perspective of the people they're supposed to be benefiting at the heart of them, rather than often the focus on the system and how much money it saves and how it improves flow and reduces number of days and frees up beds and all that stuff. I wondered whether there was a way just thinking because got loads of researchers on the call so they'll be thinking about different studies is that is that potential and um, just thinking of the trials archive in itself well, first of all there's always a time lag because obviously like we aren't going to start using anyone's data before they've properly you know research uh, analyzed it and published it so like the the most recent data we have is 2019 i think so in terms of all the new intervention the new initiatives it's not going to be at the main, at, like at the current thing, but potentially in a few years' time as new trials come on, um, I think that sounds a wee bit sm like it's bit it's it's like the hospital information as well as opposed to like the stuff that's actually gone on in the care home. So a lot of the time, the trials, if they're if if the trial is about the care home, once they're if they do get admitted into hospital, they, they, that follow up kind of stops until they go back into the home because it's about what happens whenever they're in the care home. So probably not for the archive, but I think Anne was going to unmute. Maybe did you have something to say? Right. Yeah, I suppose I, I was really struck by um, in, in what Guy was saying and Liz's question now. Um, yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you about what might or might not be available already in the data that, that's already been collected. But I think that the emphasis has really got to be on partnership projects. I think it's got to be on really trying to be partners when we develop the project, when we're asking the question um, and when we're thinking about how to answer it. Um, and I think there's, there's, Karen, your work in Niche is absolutely an example of this where, where the care homes there and the people there are absolutely to the fore in it. But we probably um, need to think about those who fund research. And I know that NIHR have had a super um, thing in the last uh, year or so, developing the people who work in social care, professional development around research. So offering people um, a bit of development opportunity and, um, and mentoring. But absolutely, this is gonna be about resource, isn't it? Because to have the time to even think, great, I wanna get into a partnership you know, with my local researchers, people are going to need some sort of resource. So I think it's for any of us who have any sort of voice or influence with research funding to emphasise that, that that's something that, that should be resourced. Because I think that without that partnership work, we just can't have the insights into what's going to be the most workable, realistic, valuable kind of approaches. Thank you, Anne. Karen, you've got your hand up. Yeah, just to follow up on, on that important point by Anne, I think it's also important to realise that research requires a range of skills and expertise and actually um, care home staff, family, residents come to that with that expertise. And so I think it's how, how we have a, a language that allows partnerships to develop and not um, putting people off because I think it can be off putting to think we have to turn everybody into researchers or they have to understand research language. I think the responsibility is with us to to make our work accessible, to engage people and take people with us um, and working through some of the difficulties if people do drop out because they're dropping out for a reason. So it's a plea really, I guess, since so many researchers are here that, you, you know, having that in mind. And I know that's not what you meant, Anne, but I think it's an important sort of addition uh, to, the, to the point that you were making. Thanks. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, and I would just, just want to say while we're on here and there are some people, if we have had one or two people who've moved on from our panel. So if anyone is in the care home manager, member of staff or family member who would be interested to be part of our panel, please do get in touch. Lovely. 
Um, thanks, Guy, for um, putting details on how to access the leaflet from the process evaluation review, um, given that the QR code was faulty. That's really helpful. Thank you. And um, Lisa, who, who's put up in the chat, thank you for saying that the next statue webinar is on Friday, the 13th of October. And uh, it will be looking at a realist review of a minimum data set used in care homes. Um, Claire will, uh, um, will be leading on that. Um, how do care home staff interpret and use quality of life assessment tools and scales? Nick Smith on, will be talking to that. And um, implementation of a minimum data set, um, Ian Lang and uh, Lucy Webster and Rachel Carroll will be telling us more about that. So. Um, it just remains for me to thank you all for um, logging in and um, being interested in the DACTRA study um, and to thank our presenters for the, their presentations today and above all to thank Claire who's been um, our leader in this work and has really strived so hard um, not just to do research for research's sake but to take up every opportunity that we can um, to engage with care homes and to um, seek to make a difference through the research for them too. And I guess that should be our abiding message. So wishing everybody a lovely weekend. Um, thank you for joining us. And um, yeah, hope to see you at the next one. Take care. Bye. Thank you.